who is immune to the coronavirus and what does that mean? So you may have seen a couple of these articles that were floating around talking about who is immune to the coronavirus and what does it mean? What do we know about it? You know, the reality is that most of our understanding of coronavirus immunity comes from SARS and MERS, not from those, but from seasonal coronaviruses. A little bit from SARS and MERS, a lot more from seasonal coronaviruses. And now, obviously, we're starting to get information about SARS-CoV-2. So let's talk about those for just a second. We've had information about the seasonal coronaviruses since, what, 30 years, 1977 and 1978. Small study, 18 volunteers were inoculated with a coronavirus strain. All of them developed colds. Six were re-inoculated after one year. None was infected with the re-inoculation. The remaining 12 were exposed to a slightly different strain and protection was only partial for that different strain. So again, it's not like we've got thousands of individuals in that sample, but again, you can start to get some of this picture that, yep, there does appear to be some crossover between at least those two strains, but what does that mean for SARS-CoV-2? Again, don't know quite yet. Study number two was in 1990. 15 volunteers at that point were inoculated, 10 were infected, 14 were re-inoculated with the same strain after one year. Less severe symptoms and fewer viruses than the initial inoculation. So again, you see a similar picture as what you saw before and what you tend to see within families of viruses. You tend to see some crossover, but not complete. Another thing that you tend to see is with a lot of viruses, even with it, the exact same virus a year later, incomplete, not 100% coverage, but significant improvement in, in immunity from being totally native or virgin to that specific infectious agent, that virus. So obviously there were no direct experiments done on SARS and MERS, but there's information that we have from, for example, they detected antibodies in survivors suggesting some protection for some time two years for SARS and three years for MERS. From these experiments, we can assume that COVID-19 survivors will have an immune response. The vast majority will. But what does the vast majority mean? Some have, will have better response than others. And protection may last in the medium term at least a year, although effectiveness might decline. One of the bigger questions that we covered in the antibody test was the discussion of sensitivity and specificity. I'm not gonna get technical and talk about what drives those, but I will say this, in a very low prevalence disease, very low prevalence, meaning only 2% of us have it, which is gonna be likely the case after the first wave of the coronavirus. Even with a relatively good test, a positive antibody test is as likely to be a false positive as a true positive. So you put that together with what we're talking about with programming today, and it makes you a little bit nervous about this whole idea of Oh, okay, so once I get the a positive antibody test, I'm free, I'm good to go, and I'm safe, right? And I can't transmit it either. Again, it reminds you of that dirty Harry quote, are you feeling lucky? So these obviously, these discussions, these thoughts, these concerns, these facts will become an important issue in terms of considering herd immunity, as well as considering return to work, return to society, from our current lockdown. So some major issues and questions. COVID-19 reinfection, is that what's going on? Or was it just a false negative test, false positive test? Could have worked either way. So for example, you get a test, you think it's negative. Actually, it was the true test result, what should have been positive. That's not so much of an issue with the reinfection. But think about the opposite. You get an antibody test, it's positive, you think it's a true positive, turns out not to be the case, and then you get 
a, an infection. Was that a reinfection? No, it was a previous false positive test. And again, you can start thinking of scenarios in this and the logic can sort of turn your mind inside out. It's just something to be thinking about, something to be aware of as we go to the next phase of trying to get folks back out into the workforce. Only a minority will be immune to the SARS-CoV virus, obviously. We are not ready as a society to take enough of infection rate to create herd immunity. For something as infectious as SARS-CoV-2, again, we've talked about it multiple times, maybe an r naught reproductive index of three, maybe even just two, but still a significant reproduction index. It's not going to be two or four or 10 or 20 percent. Previous infection giving us herd immunity, it's probably going to have to be 50 percent of us infected or more. So we're not going to be ready to take to wait till herd immunity. Mild illness might not always give immunity as well. You've seen that with other viruses. And there's some literature, some science out there that would indicate that's actually what's happening with SARS-CoV-2. For example, there were 175 Chinese patients in one study, 70% with strong antibody responses, 25% with a low antibody response, and 5% developed no response at all. So then again, you get back into that question, well, do these 25% with low response and the 5% with no response at all, how much of that is poor cross-reactivity to the test, perhaps a false negative test? How much of that was they did not create and retain significant immunity? Again, things we'll have to learn as we continue to learn more about this virus. Other problems, confounding is always a problem. It's a classic epidemiological issue. It's where the risk for the disease is also associated with the outcome. It gets a little bit technical. Again, the logic sort of twists your head inside out, won't go there. Will infection with one coronavirus offer immunity against a related coronavirus? As you see with seasonal flu and other viruses, as they pass through huge populations of hundreds of millions of people, you get new variations. Viruses tend actually to mutate to a milder form because a milder parasite is more effective. It, gets, it has more hosts that it can infect. So that's a potential good news situation for this, for this as well as any other virus. But have we seen that yet? Uh, again, I think it's way too early to tell. And what have we seen with mutated influenza viruses? Some cross-reactivity, or again, just not very, very predictable at all. So will immunity to a coronavirus worsen infection to another strain rather than prevent it? And you've actually seen that with some of this. It's creating much more of an immune response, much more of an inflammatory response. And one of the things that we know gets back to that discussion about prediabetes, inflammation, the thing that's killing people in COVID-19, the serious form of the disease is inflammatory reaction. So is, is it possible that in prior infection can make it more likely to have that high level inflammatory reaction? As you can see, we've got a lot of things to learn and these are not insignificant items. Our lives depend on it. Why wait for a disease and hope for a cure? I used to be an ER doc. My name is Ford Brewer. I quit ER after a few years because it was just so frustrating. Most of the things bringing people into the ER are things that should have been prevented, including heart attack, stroke, number one cause of death, number one cause of permanent disability. People think that you're just gonna have those and that they're not predictable. Both of those are wrong. You, they are predictable and you don't have to have them. Usually it's lifestyle. Lifestyle is more important than supplements and even prescription drugs and even stents and surgery. But the current times are tough. Major financial impact with the lockdowns that most states have been going through. We've been working on a way to make this much more affordable with a subscription process. And that's exactly what we're announcing today. We've got two levels. One is the silver membership where you get access to our courses, a private webinar each month, 
and access to their supplement store and supplement recommendations and prescription. Or I would suggest even more so the gold membership. You can get a script for a Freestyle Libre and find out what your blood sugar metabolism is doing on a daily basis. And you can get a lab order for inflammation, OGTT, and insulin survey. You can also get a 30-minute one-on-one with me. So I'm looking forward to seeing you. Cost is no longer an excuse. So if you're interested, go to go.prevmedheartrest.com slash prevmed dash subscription or call us at 859-721-1414, 859-721-1414 or email us at myhealth at prevmedheartrest.com. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank you.